Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live Q&A in the expert classroom with our fantastic Paralympic athletes, Danny DeToro and Tim Matthews. Now, Tim's just having a little bit of trouble getting logged on, but as soon as he does, we'll get him to join us here. So I hope you've all got your questions ready. I'd like to introduce you to Danny DeToro, everyone. Danny, are you there? Hello, everyone. Hi, how's it going? Good. Um, can you see me? Not right oh, this God. second. No. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Technical difficulties. I think we're oh, all having the same kind of year of it. There Hello, you. everyone. Sorry about that. G'day, oh. everyone. Now we're just waiting for Tim to join us. Uh, so we might start off with you if that's okay. Of course. Fantastic. All right. So in this little Q&A, we've got loads and loads of people logged on, ready to give you the, all of their questions. But I just wanted to start off by talking about how fantastic the Paralympics actually is for celebrating skills, attributes and achievements and not just what not just focusing on what people can't do. So how has that affected you as an athlete? Yeah, look, I think that's a really important one. Um, for me, I had an accident when I was 13 and that put me in a wheelchair. And for the first, um, you know, two weeks, especially, you're being told what you can't do, what is going to change for you, what is things that you're going to have to relearn. And it's really easy to feel like life maybe is going to be really difficult. So when I first met Paralympians, I was still in hospital. And what they showed me is that um, you're not, you don't need to be defined by some of the worst or hardest things that's ever happened to you. And, and that life is, is um, up to you to what you want to make of it. So they taught me very much that I had the power to um, make my life as awesome as I wanted it. And what I wanted was a really awesome life. So I really looked to lots of people within the Paralympic community as to what an awesome life can look like. And for me, they're my mates. So I get to be surrounded by these really awesome humans who are doing extraordinary things, not just in sport, but in their lives. Like they're being awesome humans doing incredible work everywhere within their whole life. And for me, that's the best part of, of being a part of this Paralympic movement. Oh, fantastic. Absolutely. And we appreciate that you've done some amazing things in your life and you've had a pretty good one at the moment. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your journey from having the accident to where you are now? Yeah, so I was in hospital for four months and that first month was just lying on my back and that was just really hard. Like I was a 13-year-old kid and that was really weird and hard to do. So once I kind of was able to sit up, I knew that in order for me to get home and for me to get back to doing all the normal stuff, I had to just get really strong and really fit and become really, I guess, mentally tough in a way. And I had great people who were helping me along the way. And um, within four months, I went back to school. And probably two months after I came out of hospital, I went to my first wheelchair tennis tournament. And um, I didn't know, you know, I played lots of tennis before my accident. And um, I was playing lots of competition. And I was wasn't going to be, you know, Serena Williams, but I was, I really was, was pretty competitive and really enjoyed it. So I was playing lots of club tennis. And um, so then when my accident happened, we started doing rehabilitation and a big part of rehab is doing sport because sport is definitely one thing that you can do that um, allows you to just feel like you've got a bit of control and you feel like things are going to be pretty cool. So uh, I started playing tennis and rehab and then, yeah, two months later played my first tournament and um, it was, it was an incredible eye opener. I saw the number one woman in Australia, she played there and I'm like, Oh, I reckon I could beat her. So um, then, you know, January, that, that January I did beat her and became number one in Australia. And I was like 14 years old. And um, I just, I've been playing pretty much ever since um, I started traveling internationally when I was 15 and that was incredible. You know, I got to travel the world, like sports given me so many opportunities and a big part of that is traveling around the world and, and seeing how other people live and seeing that, we're so lucky here in Australia. We've got so many opportunities and we can almost do whatever we want. Like it's, it's really awesome. So yeah, I, I got to just really experience the world in a really great way. Um, when I was 22, I got to, um, I was like number four in the world in my early twenties and then got to number one, um, played six Paralympic games and um, I'm looking forward to hopefully playing Tokyo next year for my seventh Paralympic games. 
Well, we will definitely keep our fingers crossed for you, Danny. <laughs> Hi, it's Tim. How's it going? Hello. My apologies for uh, joining late. I've had uh, all sorts of computer issues today, but I'm here now. All good. I'm sure we're all used to the computer issues right now. So we were just chatting about the sports opportunities that Paralympics Australia has brought to our amazing athletes. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your own journey? Yeah, sure. So I was born um, in regional Victoria without um, an arm and without my left arm and a few other medical problems as well and spent probably the first uh, 18 months of my life in hospital, um, mainly with some stomach issues and some back-related issues. But from a young age, played lots of sport, loved sport, and Paralympic sport was never an option for me. I didn't know anyone else with a disability. I didn't, um, I'd never competed against anyone with a disability before in disability sport. But I was actually playing in a tennis tournament in Melbourne when I was about uh, 21 and someone tapped me on the shoulder who had watched me play and said, um, hey, mate, have you thought about Paralympic sport? And I said, no, not really. And he said, mate, you look pretty quick across the court. Why don't you come and have a go at running? Because he'd been to the Paralympics as an athlete. So I actually um, ventured up to, to Sydney about four weeks later for a competition, uh, ran in bare feet had no idea what I was doing, um, but won my events and the head coach at the time, uh, Chris Nunn, tapped me on the shoulder and he said, look, mate, have you thought about Paralympic sport? Um, Atlanta Games are not too far away. Do you want to come? So I bought myself a pair of spikes, started training, got myself a coach and went to Atlanta about eight months, eight months later to the Atlanta Paralympic Games. So it all happened pretty quick for me, but opened so many opportunities so many doors, great way to travel, and met some great people such as Danny along the way. Yeah, fantastic. It sounds like those connections are really valuable to you guys as athletes in, uh, in terms of kind of building that community as well. Yeah, I think we're all um, come with a, a, a common background in some respects that um, face adversity to different levels, some born with it and some acquired, but We've all got that in common in some ways, but um, I guess once we're competing at a at a higher level, it's about the sport and and the outcome and high performance more so than the disability, I guess. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Important to focus on that as well. Uh, now, to everyone who's joining us, I can see that you're popping questions in the Q and A. Now, I can't see that from there, so I can't see your questions. If you wouldn't mind popping them in the chat box so I can see them and pass them on to our athletes, that would be fantastic. Danny, we've got a question for you that's come in. Have you met Naomi Osaka? No, but how cool would that be to meet Naomi Osaka? She's the best. Um, I love her. I think she's amazing. And she's an incredible athlete, but she's also doing incredible things. Like she's using uh, her platform as a really awesome athlete to kind of um, make a lot of great change in, in the world. And I think that's extraordinary. That's a really great thing that I think uh, sports people have the ability to do and I think she's using it in a really awesome way definitely thank you um Tim question for you what is your proudest achievement and that's from Zara yeah proudest achievement um I think probably being able to compete at the, at the Sydney Paralympic Games in front of my family and friends it was the first time my parents had ever seen me compete at any level of of my athletics so to have them there live um was, was fantastic and to be a part of such a great team, um, the, the Paralympic team, our Australian Paralympic team in Sydney finished on top of the medal tally, uh, the track and field team won 32 gold medals and I was fortunate enough to be a part of two of those. So just to be a part of that team, that environment at the Sydney Paralympic Games was probably the best achievement. Fantastic, thank you. We've got another one from Kathy for you, Tim. Kathy asks, what was your favourite sport when you were younger? Yeah, so when I was young, I played uh, golf, tennis and baseball were my uh, three sports. Um, I started playing golf when I was young. I got my handicap down to just under 10, uh, but I couldn't quite hit the ball far enough to, to reach the really long par fours. But golf was my first love, I guess. I played lots of baseball when I was young. So I, um, because I was quite quick, I used to steal bases a lot and I'd play shortstop. So uh, shortstop or centre field. So I'd play with the glove and um, in my hand and 
I would literally catch the ball in my glove and then throw the ball up a little bit, flick the glove off, catch the ball and throw it where I needed to. So I, I guess I just always found different ways of doing things depending on what sport it was for tennis. Um, I'd put the ball on my racket, roll it off the top of my racket to serve. Um, yeah, so I just played lots of different sports. Fantastic. It sounds like being a Paralympian of so many different types of sports, you are a very adaptable athlete as well. Yeah, I think you have to be, um, if you're born with a disability, you, you just learn to do things a different way. I think the, the thing that was interesting for me, um, competing in Atlanta for the first time and seeing other um, people with one arm, basically the same as me, and watching them put their uh, put their watch on or do their shoelaces up. And it was the first time I looked and thought, actually, I must look like that. And I didn't realise I'd look like that until I'd seen them do it. I thought I'd always done things pretty normal, the same as everyone else. But I, because I didn't know what that was normal for me. So it was just sure. interesting to visual to see that for the first time. Amazing. Thank you. Um, Danny, Rebecca's asked, did tennis feel like an escape to you? Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, tennis always felt like a happy place, you know, like um, there's nothing better than hitting a ball really, really hard and feeling like it just feels fun to do that. You know, I always felt like that about tennis before my accident. And so being able to kind of play tennis um, in a wheelchair, it was really hard to begin with. Like, so in the beginning, it probably didn't feel um, much like an escape. It felt very much like a bit of a trap in a little way because it was like oh I have to learn how to to do different things and how to um I guess adapt you know as Tim was saying and so um in the beginning it was a really it was a big adjustment because I was really used to being able to run around and hit big serves and come in for the volley but um it didn't take too long to kind of start to learn how to do that in a wheelchair and then I was doing that I was same way you know big serves coming for the volley and you just feel so free when you're out there you're in the sun and you're sweating and you're hitting really hard balls and you feel awesome it's always it's always felt really good oh fantastic and zara's asked a follow-up question on that are you proud of who you are today oh zara thanks proud god that's a such an interesting question eh because like i don't know if i feel proud maybe i'm not sure like i feel like you should oh that's so cute that's really kind of you to even say that tim but proud i feel like there are days where I feel like some there are things that I do that some good things that I do and other days where I feel like I could be doing things so much better, you know. So some days I feel like, yeah, I'm doing I'm doing all right. <laughs> proud is a funny one because I feel like you're doing better than you are. Oh, bless you. Like I feel like, I don't know, proud's a funny one, isn't it? Because I feel like I feel humble mostly. Like I feel just grateful more than anything. I feel like if I can make a, a positive impact into someone else's life, then that's really cool. Like I don't know if I feel proud about that but I feel happy that I can kind of help people and contribute and and have a bit of a meaningful life because you know that takes a big effort so when we can do that and we can do things that are good for us and for other people then that I think that's an awesome life so Definitely. yeah thanks for the question great question so we've got lots of questions coming in from class 6g hi guys um they've got a million questions so I might just shorten these down <laughs> and uh Put the first one to you, Tim. Who is your sport role model? Um, I, I wouldn't say I have a, a particular role model. Um, I know when I, um, growing up, um, uh, or when I first got involved in Paralympic sport, I guess some of the, the athletes that had been in the sport for a couple of games, and it was really um, great to understand about the way you carry yourself in that sort of environment and how to... I guess um, what I learned quite quickly is everything's not as good as you think it is and it's also not as bad as you might think it is. So it's always good to have a pretty level playing field because there's always days where uh, you think you're going to feel great and compete really well and for whatever reason you don't and then some other days you don't feel great and you come out with a great performance. So um, I, th I think I just learned a lot from different people involved in the sport with different experiences. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and Danny, one for you. Who was the most supportive person that helped you through the, some of the tough times? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I've got, I'm so lucky. I've had so many, you know, my family, particularly when my accident happened, 
like it's it's a big shock for me but it was a bigger shock for my parents you know and my brother my little brother he was he struggled a lot too and I've always worked hard to have good people around me so even as a as a going back to school like have good schoolmates like not everyone understands where you're coming from and sometimes people can just say really stupid and hurtful things but it's really important for me just to be surrounded by people that um just really get where I'm at and are supportive and kind and caring and so I've had lots of them so from my school years and then um all my coaches I've had some really great coaches and really a good team around me that's just really helped me be the best person I can be and sometimes that's been them telling me that you know I'm, I'm not being so great sometimes that's them being really honest with me about how I can be better and I really value that you know like I really I love people being really honest with me and um, when I know it's coming from a really good place when they just want me to be the best version of myself and they're trying to help me because you don't sometimes you don't know when when you're not doing the best you know sometimes you think you're doing all right but when you've got good people around you who can be um really good mirrors and and try and help you be better than you were yesterday then that's what I'm looking for. So I've got heaps of people around me, good mates. I've got a really good life with really good people in my world. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Last question from class 6G. You guys are fantastic with your questions. Keep them coming through for now. Um, if you weren't an athlete, this one's to Danny and Tim. If you weren't an athlete, what would you be doing? Uh, I'll start with that, Dan. That's a great question. I, I grew up in regional Victoria, um, and my dad's a farmer, my brother's a farmer, and before I'd actually competed at that competition that I referred to in, in Sydney, I'd actually not been out of Victoria. So um, I would have probably worked on a farm, would be my, would be my guess. Awesome. You would have grown up with all of those skills. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. And Danny? I could see you on a farm, Timmy. Can see you being yeah. a great farm hand. I, I do enjoy getting home and uh, feeding the cows every now and then. I bet oh, you do. Lovely. Oh, bless. <laughs> oh, that's a good question too, um, class. That's a really awesome one. Um, before my accident, I wanted to become a surgeon. My plan was to become a brain surgeon, cut people up, fix them, send them home, make them feel better. <laughs> Um, but having an accident meant I had to change uh, what I wanted to do. So in the end, I ended up kind of helping people through psychology. And then I went and did a Chinese medicine degree. So there's a, there's a degree of um, helping people and getting them um, on the right path to achieve, you know, some really good physical and mental health. That's been really important to me. So I still do that. Like I've always felt that um, sport's one thing I do and it is a full-time job, but I've always studied and I've always um, worked at the same time and so really it's like two full-time jobs which is actually super intense and that hasn't always been easy but it's always been a really important thing for me to do. Great it sounds like it really keeps you busy as well. <laughs> um, Tim we've got a question from Wackle Borough Boys uh, Primary School. Hi guys they yeah. asked what type of farmer would you be? Uh, probably a beef farmer to be honest. Uh, it's what my what my dad did and my brother's involved in. So, yeah, I'd probably be a beef farmer. Fantastic. Now, I know this particular school have joined us with some of our virtual classroom sessions for Meat and Livestock Australia with farmers. So I know they know a bit about those. So hopefully they're yeah. not planning on testing you on anything. Sure. That's OK. <laughs> Now, on the screen, we've got a couple of photos from the Paralympics and from some amazing athletes. We've got you, Danny, there, and we've got Madison de Rosario there. And I wanted to just talk about some of the special tools and equipment that you guys might use um, and how fantastic the Paralympics is on providing that kind of equipment to help every and all athlete compete and be successful. Um, now, I learned something this year that was really interesting about the, the medals for the Paralympics. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the amazing technology that you have in the medals that, um, that get given out? Go for it, Timmy. Yeah. So I, get, I guess in terms of the, the equipment to start with, there are lots of different types of equipment across different sports that, are, that is required, depending on um, what your impairment is and the sport you play. Obviously, for some individuals, that's a significant barrier to participate in sport. So we're really pleased through Paralympics Australia, we do have an equipment fund, which is supporting emerging athletes and um, local programs 
to uh, address some of those gaps, whether it be wheelchair, um, wheelchair, wheelchairs for wheelchair tennis or wheelchair basketball, some racing chairs, uh, prosthetic legs, all sorts of equipment that might be required. Uh, in terms of the medals, they always tend to do different things depending on um, for each game. So I know for the Atlanta medals in 1996, we had, you might recall, then we had Braille on the back of the, on the back of the medals, which I always found um, difficult to read because I don't read Braille, obviously. Um, but the Sydney medals were fantastic. I've actually got one of my Sydney medals here. Um, so the great thing I loved about the Sydney medals were all the venues for each of the competition venues were around the outside of the medal, <laughs> the Opera House and the Harbour Bridge um, in the middle. So Sydney medals were great. I know the, the uh, Rio medals, they actually were audible, so they had a little um, something inside the metal that when you shook it, um, it, it resonated or there was a, a sound, which was great for the, the vision-impaired athletes. I think it was great for them to be able to um, hear what the medals look like. So they always do something different depending on what the, what the games are, and I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sure Tokyo will have something pretty special in mind. I know they're, they're released, but I've not actually had the pleasure of touching one yet. Um, so, yeah. Well, maybe Danny will be able to show you hers when she gets it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I might be borrowing one from we'll Maddie D. That, Rosario. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Now, guys, we got 30 questions in the Q&A box and I can't see them. So put them in the chat box. I really want to see what you're asking here. Now, the next part of our Q&A is a bit of a game, if you guys are up for it. I've got a bit of a true and false game just to test your knowledge of the Paralympics, if you feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we kick off on those, I've got some very quick fire questions. Class 6G have asked, how many medals have you won? Uh, yeah, you go, Dan. Yeah, I've won two Paralympic medals. I've won a silver medal in Sydney and a, a bronze medal in uh, Athens. Um, for, for wheelchair tennis, it's really interesting because I, I travelled a lot and, it, you know, the, the Paralympics is won every four years. So um, for me, it's always been a big thing is, is um, Grand Slams and Super Series events and... Um, and there's been a few more of those, but unfortunately I could never quite convert it to a gold medal like Timmy's been able to do. He's a bit of a superstar. No, I only, I only did that with some support of others. So I was part of a relay team in Atlanta that won a gold medal in 1996 and then in Sydney 2000, um, a couple of gold and a couple of bronze medals at that level. So I've, I've got five Paralympic medals. Um, unfortunately, mate. Unfortunately, the one that I really wanted to win in Sydney, more 100 metres, I lost by two one hundred one hundredths of a second. So that was a bit of a frustrating one for me. But anyway, oh, we moved on. So close. <laughs> All right. Now, everybody joining us from home or from school, you can join in with this game as well. This is a true or false game. So here's your first question. The first sporting competition for athletes with a disability was only for those in wheelchairs. Is that true or is that false? Pop your answers in the chat box. Guys, do you know much about the history of the Paralympics? A little bit. I, I would say that is true if, if we're referring to um, the event that I'm thinking we're referring to. Mm -hmm. I would say that's true. Do you know when it started? Uh, if 1948, if we're talking about Stoke Mandeville. You are bang on. That is, of course, true. And there is a photo from that Paralympics. And the men and women that were involved in that game, there were 16 of those athletes, all in wheelchairs, and they were injured from their service in the war and they took part in wheelchair archery. Now, what a long way we've come, hey? Yeah, yes. completely. And that's the thing, you know, it wasn't just about sport, but it was about making sure that people who... Um, had been injured, had really meaningful lives, like that could actually live past a year. Like back then, like if you had a spinal cord injury, you you didn't you didn't survive that. Like this is a very different time. You know, you died of a pressure sore or an infection, and and so that was a really big part of making sure that we took care of people who who had injuries and you know let them kind of um, explore and, and live really rich and meaningful lives. 
Absolutely. And we've got a great question coming in from Saren. Hi, Saren. Saren asks, if when you feel overwhelmed or stressed, what's your number one advice to get through it all? Do you want to start with that one, Dan? Sure. Well, for me, um, I love listening to music. So music helps me heaps, slack. Having a bit of a dance, having a bit of a sing. I have a terrible singing voice, but like I think that when I sing out loud and I am listening to some music, that makes me feel good. That helps. Um, I love getting in the garden. So we grow lots of our own veggies and we grow lots of our own fruit and veg. So I love getting in the garden because it reminds me that, you know, it's going to be all right. Like everything that you feel is is really temporary. It comes and it goes, you know, the bad feelings go and they keep coming and keep going. Like it, nothing sticks around forever. So, um, but I reckon bang on some big tunes, get loud, have a dance around. Fantastic. Now Parker's asked, what is your favourite song? Have you got a favourite song? Me? Yeah. Oh, I've got too many. I've got too many <laughs> favourite songs. It depends what mood I'm in. Um, I like lots of stuff. I like, I like rap. I like hip hop. I like reggae. I like funk. I like everything except probably hardcore heavy metal. Yeah. Maybe make us a playlist and stick it up on Spotify and then maybe some of our students can join in your jams. <laughs> <laughs> it's all over the shop. Get ready. I love it. Tim, what about you? Do you have any hobbies that will help kind of help your mental health? Um, I've, I've got a couple of young kids. I'm not sure if they help or hinder my mental health, <laughs> um, but I, I do love spending time with them. They both do little acts and um, my boy Jack, he's, He's nine and he just loves sport. So he plays footy and cricket and little ass and just um, loves get, riding a bike. We go for lots of bike rides and particularly in COVID at the moment, being in uh, Victoria, there's lots of things that we can't actually do, but we can actually exercise. So it is great to be able to get out of the house and spend some time with the kids and uh, get some fresh air. Definitely. Now, we've got a few questions coming through about COVID and how that's kind of affected you. But you're a coach now, Tim. So how has that, um, how has the pandemic kind of affected your athletes training? Yeah, I'm actually only coaching one athlete at the moment. And it, and it has been a bit of an impact. So I live uh, north of Melbourne, but considered regional. And my, my athlete lives in Geelong. Um, so we're not actually able to meet halfway in the in the city so I've had to travel down to Geelong to coach her and coaching her a lot remotely um, so it has been a bit of a challenge but and a, and a big impact on a lot of athletes uh, preparing for the games obviously uh, it's one thing for the, the Tokyo games to be delayed by a year but then to, the added impact of not being able to freely move to training and from training um, and also consider it consider all the health risks associated with that as well. So there's been a lot for a, a lot of athletes to weigh up their support staff. So it really has been a bit of a challenge, but um, most with the right attitude and, and support have been able to get through pretty well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I was going to go on to another question here, but we've got a fantastic question that's come through from St. Columbia Anglican School. Hi, guys. Now, they've asked, how have you handled discrimination or being discriminated against? Uh, I'll touch on that to start with, and I'm sure Dan's got some points. Um, to, I guess growing up, I grew up in regional Victoria. I had a great group of mates, great friends. And I don't think there was ever a time I was discriminated against until I uh, was about under 14 and I was playing baseball and I wasn't selected for the next level of competition for, um, for the regional level up. And the reason the coach said that I wasn't selected was because I had one arm, um, not because I wasn't faster than the others, that I couldn't catch better, that I couldn't throw, a catch and release the ball quicker. So I ended up challenging the coach to put me up against a couple of their uh, other players that were selected to see who could actually catch and release the ball quicker. And I, I could actually beat them. Um, so then I was included in that squad because of that. And that was probably the first time that I, I realised that I was discriminated against. Uh, but to be honest, it's for me, it's been more about 
um, attitude and just being able to take some things head on and challenge um, those times when you feel like you you have been discriminated against. Um, but for someone like myself, who's I, I probably haven't had to deal with access issues and and some of those types of things that someone with uh, that might be in a chair or or more significant impairment might face. Fantastic. What about you, Danny? Have you had to go through discrimination from anybody? Yeah, that's a funny one because I don't feel like I've been overtly discriminated. Like it's it's the little things, you know. It's like when I was in high school, um, I was like number four in the world in wheelchair tennis internationally, but my PE teacher had no idea what to do with me. Like it's those weird things where people think they they – they make judgments about what you can and can't do and they make decisions around what you can and can't be involved with. And so whether that's just a bit of a lack of education or discrimination, not sure, you know, every day there's lots of things that, um, cause I use a wheelchair, there's heaps of things I can't get into, but sometimes it's about being a bit creative about how to do stuff. And, um, and I, I feel like you have to be out and about so that people can see you and start thinking about, Oh, you know, how can my shop be able to have, you know, someone with a disability or someone with a, um, a service animal, like someone with vision impairment and a guide dog, or if you don't see people who are kind of, who are different or have different needs, then you're not thinking about, you know, how you can make your, your house or your workplace or your school, like more accessible or easier to use for different people. So in terms of like outright discrimination, I don't really feel like that's happened heaps, but I feel like we're kind of always educating people on how to, to think about, you know, what, what might be easier and what might be better for people with not just disability, but all kinds of different things going on for them. Absolutely. Thank you. That's definitely important things to think about, especially when we live in such a diverse country and a country that really prides itself on inclusion and championing to each individual person. That's very important to keep front of mind, I think. Fab. All right. So let's move on to another true or false question. Now, Tim, I know you've been sitting there for a bit, but I hope you haven't been Googling the answer to this. So here you go. No. How much can you remember? The Paralympics Australian emblem is three arcs coloured red, black and blue. Is that true or is that false? That's a good. I've got a feeling a couple of those colours are correct, but one might not be. I think it's red, blue and green, maybe. Oh, now oh Good God. Shepherd Year 5 say that's absolutely false. Let's find out. It is, of course, red, blue and green. You're too good, Tim, too good. Well done. <laughs> very, very good. All right, we'll do one more quick one and then we'll, do, we'll go on to some quick fire questions here. So here you go. Para powerlifting is the only para sport in the history of the Paralympics allowing athletes to compete in weightlifting. Is that true or is that false? Now, while you guys are thinking about it, have either of you ever tried powerlifting or weightlifting? Uh, no, I, I used to struggle with balancing the bar um, with, with powerlifting. So I, I did use um, um, weight training in when I was competing and um, doing cleans. But, um, yeah, powerlifting for people with one arm, it's not so... Not such a good sport. <laughs> I can imagine. Danny, is that is um, weightlifting, weight training something that you include in your training? Yeah, always. Um, definitely as a wheelchair tennis player, that's a big part of it. Getting yourself uh, around the court. For tennis, you're allowed to have two bounces, but you have to be really quick and really fast and really strong. So um, I've always done that. And, yeah, weightlifting has always been a part of training. But my arms are too long, to be honest, to be a really um, professional weightlifter. I'm too tall and I'm too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's meet Michael Dow or Michael Doe. I'm not sure how to say his name. From Victoria. So your neck of the woods there, Tim. Competed in the 1964 Summer Paralympics in Tokyo. And he won five medals. He won a silver in weightlifting. Para powerlifting replaced para weightlifting in 1996. So it's actually not that long ago um, I didn't know I that. That was really interesting very <laughs> interesting there's been a sorry Dan oh no there's been a few sports that have changed over the years um, changed the way they're delivered and I actually was not aware that weightlifting was was in the Paralympic Games obviously I was aware that powerlifting was but 
there you go. I've learned something new today. There you go. Every day is a school day. We've got a question coming through from uh, 6G. Hi, guys. They say, what does your training routine include? I might uh, give that one to Danny. Yeah, yeah. thanks, 6G. Um, so because I'm playing table tennis these days um, and because I live in Melbourne as well, uh, I'm spending a lot of time playing against a ball machine and I'm getting a machine spitting out balls at me, um, which is really good for some things and not very good for other things. <laughs> Um, so right now, because I'm at home, uh, I spend a lot of time doing my own uh, weight stuff at home. So lots of um, thorough band work and uh, just fit ball stuff. Um, so a lot of it is some strength, but a lot of it, the, the most of it for me is balance. Um, and because I can't use my legs uh, to, to balance me, I have to really work hard on my kind of my back and, and my abdominals to do that and my arms in a way to do that as well. Um, so there's a bit of gym stuff um, and I get on the hand crank, which is like a, it's like a, like a hand cycle, like that's just stationary. So I do that a bit. Um, and as I said, yeah, outside uh, with the table, tennis table and the ball machine spitting out balls. Uh, and sometimes my partner will hit a few table tennis balls with me as well for when we're, when we're having a, looking to have a little bit of fun. Yeah. <laughs> is there a bit of a competitive spirit there? You're always trying to win. Always. We're both <laughs> always trying to win. <laughs> All right. Um, now on the screen, we've got a bit of a video from uh, one of your competitions there, Danny. So if we wanted to go into professional sport, where do we start? Tim's probably the best one to answer that one. Uh, I think to start with you, um, you need to have a passion for the sport and just love to train and compete. Um, if you don't love training, it's all good saying, I want to travel the world, I want to meet some great people and do all the glamour stuff and compete at the Paralympic Games and win the Grand Slams like Danny has. But what you don't see is all the hours that get that are put in to get to that point. And no one, it's because it's not the it's not the sexy stuff. So nobody, media don't cover a lot of that. It just is often a grind and you need to love the training, love the sport, um, love to compete and want to better yourself each all the time. Um, have good people around you, um, engage positive people around you and once you find your passion and you love it, just throw yourself into it and head first, do whatever you can to be the best athlete you can be and you'll find you can go a long way if you're committed. Obviously, some sports uh, or every sport takes a lot of talent to become the best in the world or compete at that elite level. Um, but it's just a matter of searching around to find what what you love, what your passion is, and and just get into it. Fantastic. <laughs> all right. So this brings us on to our quick fire question round. Let's get through all of these questions in the chat box here. Um, do you play any musical instruments? That's from Catherine. I don't. Yeah, I do. Um, I grew up playing lots of instruments. So um, I grew up playing the organ. I have a, I've got, um, yeah, I'm uh, stage four organ, uh, level four organ. Um, and I've played lots of different stuff. I'm teaching myself bass guitar at the moment, which is heaps fun. I need more time, but um, yeah, music's always important. Like I, I love it. Like I'm not, heaps good at it but I really I really enjoy it like it it keeps me really um you have to be really present to what you're doing and you have to be really immersed in it and so sometimes that's one of the best things about about it is that it takes you away from sometimes some of the other stuff that might seem a bit stressful or a little bit too much definitely thank you um, another question from Hugh what's your favorite place that you've been to uh, I'll say for me, after the I went to the Athens Games in 2004 and then um, I unfortunately got injured in Athens. I tore my hamstring in my first event after about 30 metres. So I had a holiday for the rest of the rest of the trip. But then myself and my partner went to Santorini, one of the Greek islands, and we got engaged there. So that's probably the best, most beautiful place that I've been to, I'd say. Gorgeous. Thank you. How about you, Danny? Oh, um, Japan is always my favourite. It was um, my first international trip. I was um, 
yeah, 15 and I went to Japan and I've been back ever since uh, as a tennis player, but also as a, just as a punter, just going on vacation. There's so many different things about that country. There's um, uh, some of it's really challenging and there's some tough stuff that you have to get your head around, but I love all of it. I love heaps of people. I love the culture. Um, I love the food. I love, there's, there's so many beautiful things about that place. Gorgeous. Thank you. All right. One last one to finish. What are the qualities of a great leader? Mm, gosh. <laughs> being able to listen. I think being able to listen is really important and hear what others have to say before making um, assumptions about uh, individuals, whether it's their personality or their talent or whatever it might be. So my first point would be around having really good listening and understanding skills. Yeah, and care heaps about the people that yeah. you're leading, like really care about them. Like that for me is the biggest one. You really know when someone's a great leader is like they're, they're thinking about the people that they're leading and, and they're doing that in an authentic way that's true about them. Like when you, you can really tell when someone's being um, truly themselves and I feel like when I see people doing that, it makes me feel confident that they might not always have the right answers, but, you know, like they're doing the best that they can for you. Absolutely. Well, guys, we're going to have to finish. We, uh, we've we managed to get a 45-minute Q&A instead of a 20-minute Q&A. So I really appreciate the time that you've given us today. Thank you so much for coming into the expert classroom. Do you want to say anything to our students joining us before you sign off? I just want to say thank you for having us. Love a lot of your questions, really well thought out questions. And um, enjoy the rest of your school year. Hope you go well. Have a great Christmas. And um, hopefully we'll see you somewhere. Totally. It's just been awesome. You guys have been wicked. Um, stay tuned. Next year is going to be incredible. Hopefully mm -hmm. Tokyo Paralympics is going to happen. You're going to be able to see it on TV. Get involved. You know, write us heaps of letters. The team is full of awesome humans, like doing really cool stuff. So get on board. Enjoy it. And I hope that it really... Um, it motivates you to just like get the most out of your life. Like it doesn't matter what's going on. You know, there's always room to, to see the positive in it and, and to take it um, all in your stride and let it build you to be an awesome human. So go hard people and enjoy every bit of it. Thanks for having us. Um, fantastic advice there. Thank you so much, guys. Really, really appreciate it again. And we hope to see you back in the expert classroom. And for everyone joining us, don't forget to go and check out the Paralympics Australia website. They've got some awesome school resources on there. So do go and check them out and do write those letters because the athletes do get them. Uh, otherwise, come back and see us at the Expert Classroom next time. Stay up to date with us on our channels all over the place. And remember, experts don't just happen. They learn, practice and share every day. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. <laughs>